In the previous episode of Myths of Ancient History, I took a look at a viral video published by the Universe Inside You YouTube channel, run by Stefan Dimitrov of Bulgaria. The video, written and narrated by Elizabeth Firestone, offers an explanation for what the purpose of the Egyptian pyramids is, and especially the Great Pyramid of Giza. I spent the first video, which I recommend you go watch first, I'll leave a link below, presenting for you the evidence that the pyramids were meant to be tombs. In this video, we will look at a competing hypothesis which Dimitrov advocates, that the pyramids were not tombs, but in fact, power plants. I'd love to hear your input after you watch both of my videos to the end on which explanation for the purpose of the pyramids seems more likely to you. Myths of Ancient History is aimed at dispelling common misconceptions about the past. If you're interested in ancient history, lost civilizations, and secrets from antiquity, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel, because you will get lots of it. And if you find this particular video valuable, please hit the like button and comment below with your favorite takeaway. And feel free to ask any clarification questions that you may have. Now, let's take a look at the hypothesis offered by Dimitrov. This is what his video has to say. Can advanced technology be lost and rediscovered centuries later? Is it possible that an ancient culture had knowledge of and used electrical power? Is it possible that technology can be lost and rediscovered? Of course it can. There was, for example, Roman technology that fell into disuse in the medieval period of Europe, only to be rediscovered later. In the first century CE, Hero of Alexandria is believed to have invented the steam engine long before its modern use. The question we should be asking is not whether it is possible for technology to be lost and rediscovered, but whether a specific technology actually was. How do we know it was? If we wanted to demonstrate that an ancient culture had electric power, how would we go about demonstrating that? Well, we would draw attention to clear evidence of it in the form of material remains and written records, like I just did for the tombs. But of course, for it to be a stronger hypothesis than the one about the tombs, one would have to possess even stronger evidence and be able to provide an explanation for the existence of each piece of the tomb evidence I gave. Remember, a good hypothesis will not ignore evidence, but will be able to explain all of it. So if Dimitrov's hypothesis is true, he'll need to have explanations as to why the tomb evidence doesn't count. To know for sure. Well, to know for sure, we would have to see indisputable evidence of it. This would mean clear and explicit mention of electricity in Egyptian written records. Indisputable material evidence, not only in the form of devices that generate the electricity, but also devices that demonstrate the widespread use of electricity throughout Egypt. If anyone wanted to show that a pyramid could generate electricity, this could easily be done by replicating it on a small scale, right? One could create an actual apparatus based on the pyramid design using the same materials it was made out of. If they could light a bulb this way, that would demonstrate it beyond a reasonable doubt. Why this hasn't been attempted already, I don't know. Seems like the next logical step. But let's see what Dimitrov says. To know for sure, let's look at another case where technology of power generation appears to have been used and then forgotten. Oh, I see. He's still on the question of whether it is possible, not on whether it was actually done in Egypt. In Iraq in 1934, three artifacts were found together. A ceramic pot, a tube of copper, and a rod of iron, which, when combined with a liquid acid, can be used to create chemical reactions that produce an electrical charge. Known as the Baghdad or Parthian battery, these materials date back 2,000 years. Ten years after their discovery, someone using grape juice with similar materials successfully generated a few volts of electricity. The reasoning here appears to be that if Iraq had electricity somewhere between the 3rd and 7th centuries CE, when this battery was made, 
then Egypt could have had electricity 3,000 years before that. Uh, we are actually closer in time to this Baghdad battery than the battery is to the Great Pyramid. It also has no terminals, and no evidence of the use of electricity has been found elsewhere in Iraq from the same time period. For these reasons, most archaeologists don't even think it is a battery. But historians have long assumed that thousands of years ago there was no knowledge of this technology, that this archaeological find is mere coincidence, even though we've long marveled over artifacts with intricate gold plating, which requires electricity to be created. Uh, wait, gold plating requires electricity to be created? Well, we know that that's not true. Strange statement. Quite simply, energy generation happens as a result of simple chemical properties and can be done by anyone with four basic materials. Technology often seems obvious in hindsight. Okay, so now Dimitrov gets to the actual material evidence for his claim that the Great Pyramid was a power plant. Keep in mind that most of this doesn't apply to any other pyramid in Egypt, so he appears to be separating the Great Pyramid from all the rest, but sometimes he says pyramids, so it's confusing. So, here are some important facts about the structure and the materials of the pyramid. For starters, it contains angled tunnels which lead not only into the pyramid but deep underground to areas claimed still to be unexplored. What tomb needs a shaft directed into the earth? So the first piece of evidence is that unexplored tunnels lead deep underground. You might wonder what that has to do with electricity. He does get to that later, but I should point out that one can't know how deep a shaft goes before exploring it. So to say that they go deep underground is pure speculation. We also know that centuries ago, there were enormous swivel doors that weighed no less than 20 tons. But miraculously, it was so well engineered, it could be moved to enter with a push of a hand. Since no Egyptian tomb has ever been found to be deliberately accessible, what was their interest in continuing to visit the mummies? Or could such a door have served the purpose of perhaps containing and insulating the space inside? Sir Flinders Petrie theorized that there might have been some kind of a flap door or swivel door on the Great Pyramid entrance. He got this from a passage in Strabo, but there's some question as to how that passage should be translated. Anyway, the fact that no one could find the door, even the Arabs who dug in through the outer casing to try to find the entrance only 35 feet from where the entrance was and never once noticed it, suggests that it was never there. This would be even after the white plaster finish of the pyramids had come off, revealing all of the imperfections underneath. Whatever entrance there was seems very much to have been stoned over and uh, a casing put over it, without any openings or cracks or crevices whatsoever. So that means no maintenance after completion. Though you'd almost never know it, the Great Pyramids of Giza were once covered in white polished limestone referred to as casing stones. The cuts made in this reflective stone were angled perfectly, so it would have a smooth, flat appearance. This would have made the giant structures brightly reflect the light of the sun like a mirror. It also would have made perfect insulation inside the structure. Was there a desire to draw attention to their dead? To keep mummies warm or cool, or perhaps something else? This is what we call begging the question. He says there was no reason to insulate mummies, so therefore this wasn't a tomb. But he's assuming his conclusion, that the limestone was for insulation. Maybe he isn't aware that even to this day, limestone is used in building. Google limestone buildings, and you'll see a bunch of limestone buildings not used as power plants. Limestone was an abundant and valuable resource in Egypt, and it's very strong. Good building material. If the limestone was for insulation, there is way too much of it. Does he realize that there are well over a million tons of limestone in the Great Pyramid? The pyramid is mostly limestone. It's some 230 feet thick. Next, the material, dolomite, was used on the inner surfaces. 
dolomite is known to increase electrical conductivity directly relative to the amount of pressure on it. High pressure creates more electrical current. No, 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 no. Oh, did you see the switcheroo performed right there? First, she says that pressure on the dolomite increases electrical conductivity. Okay, but then concludes that pressure on the dolomite creates electrical current. That's two different things. An electric current cannot be created by putting pressure on dolomite. Next, lining the passageways and underground tunnels of the pyramids is granite, which is slightly radioactive. Granite contains high amounts of quartz crystal with metal, and it's a well-known conductor of piezoelectricity. Piezoelectricity occurs as a result of stress or pressure on the quartz, as demonstrated by the wristwatches, which can be charged simply by rapidly shaking them. What stress or pressure is Dimitrov talking about? Later he says water pressure. But if you want to place pressure on the granite, then why put it on the ceiling? This granite actually ionizes the air inside the pyramid, creating a chemical reaction which, again, increases the conductivity of electricity. When such electrons are given the chance to bypass sections of rock via metal wire, quite large currents can flow. What metal wire? There are no metal wires in the pyramids. The amount of energy generated by the ionization of the air by granite can be mathematically calculated. I challenge Dimitrov to do the math. He'll be disappointed by the result. Another important material used to construct them is the mysterious mortar, half a million tons of it, which holds the giant stones in place. Though it's been analyzed many times, modern technology has yet to exactly recreate this gypsum, which comes from sediment. This gypsum can withstand tremendous pressure and astoundingly is even stronger than the stones themselves. Clearly, it's contributed to keeping the monument intact for thousands of years. But could there be another reason why they used a material which could withstand such high pressure? Besides holding the pyramid together, does there need to be another reason? So, limestone, dolomite, granite, supposedly constructed for a tomb, are, in fact, analogous to the exact materials we use to make electrical wires. They also share a relationship with pressure, which increases their electroconductivity. Would you say that any time you find conductive material, that means it must have been used to conduct electricity? I'm sure you'd agree. No. Let's say I put before you, side by side, all of the individual ingredients that a cell phone was made out of. Would that make it a cell phone? Obviously not the elements of the cell phone would need to be assembled into a cell phone, just like the elements of an electricity generator would need to be assembled into an electricity generator. We'll see as we go along if Dimitrov demonstrates that. Just northwest of the Great Pyramid is the Serapeum. Here there are 20 huge granite boxes, each weighing 100 tons. Classic Egyptologists say these are coffins. Yet, the granite here came from 500 miles away, and each box is so large and so heavy that there's no possible way it could fit through the existing tunnels and entrances. These supposed sarcophagi were therefore somehow built into the structure with such precision, they are within a 10,000th of an inch of being perfectly flat. Do you know why Egyptologists say that these are sarcophagi? Because we have sarcophagi in other places that look just like them. They are easily identifiable. Interestingly, if we know that a sarcophagus is sitting in the king's chamber, and that it was put in there before the roof was put in place, that demonstrates that the original purpose of the pyramid was to be a tomb. And much effort was made by the builders to make sure that it would be extremely difficult to break into the sarcophagus which suggests that they were not going for ease of access, but instead to protect what was inside. Any electrical engineer will explain that a container serving as an energy capacitor or battery must be made entirely of the same substance, so there's no interruption in the magnetic field. 
Could these boxes be just that? Well, what evidence do you have that shows this is much more likely to be an energy capacitor or battery than a sarcophagus? There's a centuries-old granite sarcophagus on display in an Egyptian museum that's thought to be unfinished. Unlike those in the pyramids, this one's cracked, suggesting that perhaps it wasn't unfinished, but simply abandoned because the crack which occurred would have interrupted the magnetic field, permitting it from successfully serving its purpose. So there is clear evidence to support the possibility of an electrical use. That's it? Dimitrov says that since one of these boxes was not used after a crack occurred in it, it must have had an electrical use. Does that make sense to you? Do you think that people would never throw away something with a crack in it for any reason except if they wanted to use it for electricity? Since these supposed sarcophagi are clearly way too large for a human being, the accepted theory is that they were, yes, believe this, bull coffins for the pharaoh's prized bulls. Makes you wonder who came up with the bull coffin theory. Dimitrov hasn't done his research. Is he not aware of the sacred bull cults of the Egyptians? There is extensive documentation of it in ancient writings. At the Serapium in Saqqara, we know that these were tombs of bulls because we have Egyptian documentation that during the reign of Ramses II in the 13th century BCE, they were hollowed out here and the tombs created specifically for the mummified remains of the Apis bulls. And in one of the sarcophagi, archaeologists found mummified bull remains. To add to the mystery, in 1993, a mysterious and inaccessible room was discovered after remaining hidden for thousands of years. Appearing to have deliberately been concealed by the structure's engineers, the room came to be called the Queen's Chamber and was finally explored in 2011 with a small remote camera to reveal a long-lost mummy? Hardly. It contained carefully crafted copper wire. And more importantly, there were instructions painted as symbols onto the floor, which appeared to show a clear wiring diagram. Dimitrov doesn't seem to be aware that the Queen's Chamber was discovered a long time ago. It was the shafts extending from the Queen's Chamber that were explored by robots in 1993, 2002, and 2011. Painted symbols were indeed found in the southern shaft, made by the work gangs, who sometimes put notes on the wall, with numbers or names and sometimes the name of the work gang. It was most certainly not a wiring diagram. But maybe in a future video, Dimitrov could show evidence that it is and make a model of the apparatus to show how it all works. That would be great. As for copper wires, no, they were not found in the shaft. Two copper pins were found on a limestone door in the shaft, no wires. Sadly, these wires have since disappeared entirely. Okay, so what do you do when you want to assert that there were wires there, but no one has ever seen them? You say that they were there, but they mysteriously disappeared. Well, at least it's not as bad as saying they were invisible or something. Good place to note, however, that the foremost Egyptologist, Zahi Hawes, was indicted for theft of Egyptian antiquities. Oh, of course. Zahi Hawass stole the wires. Yeah, because I guess it would have been just too sensational a find. It would have attracted way too many tourists into Egypt and brought in a lot of money for the country. He, he would definitely not have wanted that. Uh, unfortunately, this is an unfalsifiable claim. The logic here is that since Hawass has been accused of theft in the past, he therefore must have stolen the wires out of the shaft. And how did he accomplish this task? The shaft is inaccessible to humans, and the robot only sent a camera into the chamber on the end of a long snake. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the robot didn't have any hands, right? It could still be argued that the electrical materials used to construct the Great Pyramid are simply coincidental. Because an energy generator still requires a catalyst from another source. Well, I was going to say because the materials need to be made into an electrical system. But okay, yes, we're also missing a catalyst. Perhaps then this explains why the pyramids are geographically located over a powerful natural generator. 
underground rivers and aquifers. Physioelectricity could be harnessed from the power of the current as the water flows. And it has been proven that thousands of years ago, the Nile River passed directly by where the structures now stand. Wait, physioelectricity? What happened to the piezoelectricity? Did we change systems midway through the video? Yes, the Nile flowed near the pyramids at one time. Now show us the mechanism for harnessing this energy. Of course, this brings in a debate about the age of the pyramids themselves, along with the weathering on the nearby Sphinx, indicating that the monuments are actually double the age they're currently assumed to be. Perhaps that would explain why there's no mention of the pyramids or their creation in any of the Egyptian writings. Dimitrov actually says that there's no mention of the pyramids or their creation in any Egyptian writings. <laughs> Unbelievable. Just watching this video, you already know that statement to be false. I don't think he needed to bring in a debate about the age of the pyramids, as the Nile was close by during Khufu's reign. So if water was a source of power, it would have traveled up the limestone based on the principle of capillary action, which happens when a small area of a substance that gets wet absorbs into the entire area of that substance. So water flowing near or underneath the pyramid could have been absorbed as it passed over the limestone, even traveling upward to the top of the structure. I don't know what to make of that. Any physicist out there who would like to comment on that statement? Assuming water ran directly underneath the pyramid, which we have no evidence of, could the water be brought into the pyramid through absorption? Please comment below. The quartz in the tunnels of the pyramids would subject to the stress or vibration, creating piezoelectricity. The high force, speed of the rising water, and the pressure would be analogous to filling a syringe, generating electromagnetic energy within the structure by the materials within it and conducting it upwards to the now-missing capstone. There is no evidence of any conductive material running up to the capstone. But why? The geographical location of the pyramid may give us some clues. It is located exactly at a point which magnifies the electromagnetic forces on the planet, where telluric currents are at their strongest. Now, I tried but I've been unable to locate any scientific study that shows that the Great Pyramid sits in a spot where telluric currents are at their strongest. Dimitrov likely is referencing a study done by a team of physicists, which I will link in the references below, that suggested that the chambers of the Great Pyramid can collect and concentrate electromagnetic energy. They had to make some assumptions, such as that there are no hidden chambers in the pyramid, and that the limestone is distributed evenly throughout the pyramid, both of which hurt the electricity hypothesis. Whatever the case, Dimitrov needs to make up his mind what kind of power plant the Great Pyramid was and what kind of power plants the other pyramids were. First he was talking about water pressure. Now he's talking about electromagnetic energy. Uh, he was talking about piezoelectricity, then physioelectricity. He's all over the place. We don't know for sure what capped the pyramid, but there is speculation that it may have been gold explaining, of course, why it's long since been missing. If it were gold, this could have created a conductive path for energy to be directed upwards, high into the ionosphere. If superconductive materials were used to create this monument for energy, then the potential for something even more amazing might have been possible. Wireless electricity. So, because some have speculated that the capstone was gold, it therefore was gold. And apparently, solid gold. By the way, gold is not a superconductor. Now let's see how Dimitrov demonstrates that wireless electricity was used in Egypt. You know, to power all those ancient wireless electronic devices that have never been found. Sound far-fetched? One bold and extraordinary man swore this was possible. And he may have showed us how. We know of Nikola Tesla as the solitary genius responsible for the electric engine, radio, laser, radar, and for creating a tremendous competitive spirit in Thomas Edison. Most importantly, we know that Tesla claimed adamantly 
that he had perfected the method of harnessing and transmitting free wireless energy using the electromagnetic nature of the planet. All right, now, if Dimitrov wants to argue that the Egyptians used the same wireless energy system as Tesla, or something very similar, then we can definitely make some comparisons. But if he is just bringing up Tesla to show that wireless electricity is possible, then it doesn't really help him all that much because we still would be no closer to understanding how the supposed Egyptian power plants worked. There, of course, is nothing resembling a Tesla coil in the Great Pyramid or any of the other pyramids. No dielectric spools or coil forms, no connection points to affix metal components, no evidence of corrosion, uh, no miniature models, drawings, or written descriptions either. The thousands of pounds of copper or other metals that would be required also are absent. So if there's a magnetically oscillating current and you create a second possessing the same frequency, the wireless transmission can pass through solid materials and through long distances. The frequency which would have been released from the pyramid would have to have been matched in the surrounding area. Perhaps this would explain the obelisks, the tall monuments which could be acting as receivers, particularly if there's a quartz stone at the top of them. If he could show us these quartz stones, that would help support his theory. Sadly, they don't exist. Well, is there a hollow place at the top of these obelisks where the quartz stones would have been placed? Nope. He also doesn't seem to take into consideration that the obelisks were created centuries after the Great Pyramid. We know this because the obelisks have the names of the Egyptian rulers who built them written on them. So then why were these supposed receivers built in a completely different time period than the power plants. This would also explain the ancient carvings in Egypt, which so clearly indicate light sources, it's boggling to think anyone would even argue it. In the Hathor Temple, the Dendera light is one such image. It perfectly resembles modern electrical technology, showing a wire inside of a bulb-like area, and a box which appears to be a receiver. This is the image that Dimitrov is talking about. It boggles his mind that anyone would even argue that these are not light bulbs and that this snake here is not a filament. If these light bulbs existed and they were in widespread use throughout Egypt, you'd think we would find the remnants of a whole bunch of them. We haven't found one, not even the parts of a light bulb. There's no evidence that the Egyptians worked with glass. No glass objects, no glass making shops, not even a shard of glass, nor any other clear material for that matter. What we are looking at here is a lotus flower, the Egyptian blue lotus or water lily to be precise, associated with the god Nefertem. Lotus flowers are depicted all over Egyptian art, so it's not difficult to identify it. The lotus was significant to the Egyptians because it opened and closed with the rising and setting of the sun. The opening symbolized the dawning of a new day, new year, or new cycle, which is appropriately depicted in a temple associated with the New Year's festivals. The behavior of the lotus and its color, blue with golden yellow interior, led to a belief that it was the original container of the solar gods. In Egyptian myth, the lotus was part of creation. The sun god Re, or the god Atum in another version of the myth, emerged from the lotus in an egg. In this image, the lotus flower is spawning a snake inside of a giant pot or egg, and there's no doubt that it is a snake. What does it represent? Har Sematawi, known as Harsomptis in Greek. It means Heru, uniter of the two lands, a personification of the sky, and in his other guise as Ra Sematawi, or Resomptis, the personification of the sun, especially the new rising sun. At the Dendera temple, he is often shown as a snake. The image of a bubble surrounding the serpent also represents an actual hieroglyphic word, eterti, which means primordial sanctuary, sacred place, or sacred palace. It refers to the primordial birth sanctuary of the sun. So the bubble surrounding Har Sematawi represents the protective enclosure of the sky, the environment in which the sun is born. It's associated with the womb, or placenta, of the goddess Nut, who swallows the sun each night and gives birth to the sun each morning. Don't believe me? Well, let's look at the inscriptions. 
The inscription above the figure on the right reads, Word spoken by Har Sematawi, the Great, who resides in Dendera, the living Ba, that's a spirit, in the lotus flower of the day solar bark. In the lotus flower of the day solar bark, whose perfection the two harms of the Jed pillar carry as its image, while the Kaz, uh, these are animating spirits, on its knees are with bent arms. And the inscription above the figure on the left reads, Word spoken by Har Sematawi, the Great, who resides in Dendera, who is in the arms of the princes in the night solar bark, the noble snake, whose statue is carried by He, whose Ka carries his perfection in holiness, because of whose Ba appearing in the sky, whose shape is admired by admirers, who comes as unique, enveloped by his serpents, with numerous names in the land of Atum, the father of the gods who created everything. It's all right there for us. I'll leave you a detailed analysis of the wall art and the inscriptions in the description below this video, so you can go and get a full handle on what is depicted here. But I think it's fair to say that Dimitrov didn't even bother reading what is on the wall. The Hathor Temple at Dendera, by the way, was started by Pharaoh Nectanebo II, who reigned in the 4th century BCE, a period well documented in Egyptian history. But most of the temple, including the art we're looking at, comes from even later, the Ptolemaic period, when the Greeks ruled the land. Greeks, Persians, Romans, and all sorts of other foreigners were visiting and writing about Egypt at this time. Guess how many of them talk about the great light bulb technology of the Egyptians. Yeah, none. Across from this carving is a similar image, but the system appears to be falling into the hands of a reptilian looking being, as though it's a warning of the potential to abuse this technology. <laughs> reptilian looking being, that's the Egyptian god Upu, who has the body of a baboon and the head of a toad. How do I know that? Because near the figure, the inscription reads, your name is perfect as Upu. Your face is that of a toad. I'm not lying to you. It actually says that. And then Upu speaks. I have killed your enemies with knives, and I fell your opponents at the place of execution. In Egyptian myth, Upu is the partner of Hathor and protector of Harsamatawi. Mainstream historians scoff and make more primitive conclusions, but still, the pyramids show no sign of soot from flame torches. I guess by primitive conclusions, he means not so high tech. In my mind, his conclusions are the primitive ones because he uses the it looks like method of interpretation. It looks like this, so it must be this. It's easier because it requires no research. As for the soot, as a point of comparison, can Dimitrov show evidence of soot from flame torches in other Egyptian tombs? The ancient Egyptians used oil lamps, not flame torches. When they were digging out the pharaoh's tombs in the Valley of the Kings, they used soft animal fat to burn because it was the cheapest, but not when they were putting the finishing touches on the interior of the tombs because the smoke would have spoiled them. Castor oil, and in some special cases sesame seed oil, burned cleaner. And by making the wicks short and keeping the flame low, they made less soot. We know this because the Egyptians kept written records of everything, including the number of wicks and the amount and type of oil used every day by the tomb builders. Instead, there are multiple carvings which show these antenna-like objects that appear to be a transmitter near another object shaped like the famous symbol, the Ankh, which appears to be the receiver. This is not a receiver, but a Jed, a well-known image in Egyptian art. The Jed, sometimes called a pillar, represents a backbone and signifies stability. It has a long history of usage in art, which I don't have time to go into. There's a significant amount of documentation on the Jed, which I encourage you to go look up. What we are looking at here are columns featuring the head of Hathor. How do we know this? Because they're right outside. These Hathor columns are at the very temple from which this wall art comes. So anyone who knows even a little bit about the temple would immediately be able to identify these columns. They're also at many other temples in Egypt. The column is topped by a sistrum sound box in the shape of a temple. The sistrum was a musical instrument used in the worship of Hathor and held in these boxes. Sometimes sistrums were made in the shape of the Hathor columns. As you might surmise, 
the columns are made of stone and are not antennae. I should also mention that the ceiling of the hypostyle hall at the Dendera Temple, the temple featuring the so-called light bulb technology, is caked with soot. Given all this, it seems so much more believable that the Great Pyramid functioned using the same principles and conditions as Tesla sought to demonstrate, that they conducted and directed electromagnetic energy into the ionosphere, where it generated and transmitted electricity wirelessly to receivers within the civilization. And where would it go after being picked up by these receivers? The implications for this understanding of electrical power by an ancient culture is huge. It would rewrite history as we know it. Do you think that free energy could be transmitted wirelessly around the world? And whether or not you do believe that, do you think that if it really could do that, we would actually know about it? This conclusion sums up, I think, the reason why Dimitrov clings to this hypothesis. He wants wireless energy to be true, because it would be really cool. But instead of believing claims that tickle our fancy, our best bet is to believe claims that are solidly backed up by the evidence. The claim that the pyramids were tombs is. The claim that they were power plants is not. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you next time.